This is the Maker Pi K5. It's fully enclosed, it's got an all metal modular hot end, so it should be great for printing ABS. Is it? Let's find out. There's a reason that most people predominantly 3D print with PLA or PETG. It's easy, and by that I mean there's minimal dimensional change from changes in temperature. ABS, on the other hand, is in a category of difficult to print filaments that warp and distort. I've been building up a custom enclosed end of five for these filaments with mixed results. Would this printer be better at printing those filaments out of the box? Well, that was the question that prompted me to accept the K5 from MakerPie for review. The other thing they mentioned was that the problems that Angus from Makers Muse had in his review had now been fixed. Are they telling the truth? Let's explore. This printer is the MakerPie K5 Plus and it retails for around 750 US dollars. As you can see, it's fully enclosed, including a door, and it also comes with this clear lunchbox on top to retain any heat. It's set up for high temperature filaments with a bed that can reach 120 and a hot end that can reach 280. One thing of note is that that nozzle is modular and you can replace it with a laser engraving module that I haven't tested here. The nozzle can also be switched out for a sensor for smart leveling. It has filament runout detection, a color touch screen and Wi-Fi functionality with a camera as well. The final important details are the print volume of 200 by 200 by 300 millimeters. This is quite a large printer and as such arrived in quite a large box with the instructions on top. Large sections of foam surrounded the printer and once these were gone, I could remove the printer from the box. The body was in good condition thanks to the bubble wrap and packed inside were the rest of the components. This included the clear plastic lid. As you can see, there's quite a lot of foam protective packaging around the printer and one of the first jobs is to cut all of the cable ties so the printer can move freely. There's also some 3D printed parts that hold the hot end in place. Overall, the approach to ensuring this printer arrives undamaged seems very thorough. The hardest job in getting the printer ready to go is peeling off the protective film on the clear door. Apart from that, we slot in the filament holder on the back of the machine and then mount and feed through the bundled filament. This printer is direct drive, so this is a reverse Bowden tube and the lid has a cutout to let the tube through to the spool. Peel off the screen protector and we're done. On the included USB flash drive, we have a version of Cura. We have some STL files for slicing ourselves. We have another folder with pre-sliced G-code ready to print. We have an instructional video that takes us through the unboxing and setup of the printer. This was actually really informative. I watched it before proceeding to the next steps and it was definitely useful in ensuring things went smoothly. We also have a PDF manual that honestly is quite good. It goes through a lot of things that trip up new users to 3D printing, such as the first layer, and it has a complete guide to the touchscreen interface. The bundled version of Cura is based on one of the much older versions. It has a graphical representation of the print bed and all of the MakerPie machines already entered as configurations. There is an expert config section, but compared to the newest versions of Cura, this is really quite limited. One of the interesting things about this printer is that assuming there's no filament, the hot end simply unclips and slides out. That means we can fit a specially mounted micro switch that acts as a bed leveling sensor. Part of this assembly is 3D printed, but it clips into place and I never had any issues. With the micro switch module in place, we can now go through the leveling procedure. The print head moves to the corners of the bed and takes a measurement in Z steps for each of these locations. The touchscreen will then prompt you which corner nut to tighten and by how much. Basically, you turn it slowly until you hear a beep and that means the switch has been pressed. This process then repeats to ensure accuracy. And after it's done, the print bed moves down to the bottom and you're prompted to change back to the standard hot end nozzle ready to 3D print. Of course, you can't change the nozzles without removing the filament. So now that this is done, we need to reheat the hot end and reinsert the filament. It is more involved than some of the printers, but the video and written instructions guide you through nicely. Trouble free and easy to get started with so far. And that leveling system is a little bit involved, but if it works, it shows a lot of promise. 
Now, normally in a review, I would go through all of my test prints and then my pros and cons, but in this case, it makes more sense to go through everything as it happened. I started, as most people do, with the test prints found on the USB flash drive. They were printed on the included roll of PLA, and both this lion and owl turned out quite well. They took a long, long time to print, but the resulting surfaces are really quite smooth. Off to a good start, I switched to using the included version of Cura, and I tried out this lattice cube torture test. The other print that I tried was this cell bust from Dragon Ball Z. Both of them look reasonable, but something they share in common is the fact that there's cooling issues and that the undersides of each print could do with some work. Still, this lattice cube is called a torture test for a reason, and it's somewhat impressive that this printer can do it out of the box using a pre-set up slicer. I really wanted one of these Astro Labicon puzzles by Devon from Make Anything. I loaded up some prettier PLA, and I'd have to say these turned out fairly average. There's some prominent banding on the lower layers, and the stacking of the layers seems a bit inconsistent. My main problem you can see on the underside, which is inconsistent first layers. By this stage, I'd been through the bed leveling procedure a couple of times, but as you can see, these ones still are too far from the bed, and there's even some variation from front to back. I did keep trying because I wanted one of these to suit regular size marbles and the magic number that I used was 123%, although the inconsistent diameter of the marbles means they still don't really roll together well, so maybe it would need to be a bit bigger. Next up was some PETG and another model by Make Anything in the form of this arch puzzle. This one turned out extremely good. It's a simple shape, but I really have no complaints. Little to no stringing and very consistent extrusion. It's a nice educational puzzle perhaps good for keeping some young ones entertained if they're still stuck at home away from school. Being a direct drive printer, I thought I would test out some TPU. So I loaded up this low poly skull, turned off the bed temp and maintained the speed at 60 millimeters per second. This is another print that turned out very well. The print is plenty flexible, has a smooth surface and there was no problem with me not lowering the base print speed. Onto the real subject, printing ABS. And I started with something small and simple, which was this ball in cube. With the nozzle at 250 degrees and the bed at 100 degrees, this one printed without a hitch. Surface quality is reasonable, so we we're off to a good start. Filled with confidence, I thought I would repeat the torture test for my recent pop-up enclosure video. And unfortunately, that's where things started to go wrong. I thought perhaps that the first layer wasn't quite right and the filament wasn't really digging into the textured surface. So I test printed the simple X which I would normally use for setting up auto bed leveling, and I adjusted the thumb screws as I went to try and get it dialed in. The glass bed should be flat, but this looks like it's a little bit higher in the middle. Perhaps it gets flexed just a little bit when mounted in the machine. One thing's for sure, I was definitely getting enough grip on the first layer the whole way across the build platform, so I pushed on. This slot together 3D printed bowling alley would have been a bit of fun, but unfortunately it suffered from extreme warping. The print did complete and looked okay from the top, but when we switch to the underside, I'll put the pieces back to back. You can see the chamber wasn't really hot enough and the bed grippy enough to keep everything in place. I still pushed onward and this time with this metric screw tester. This was a lot smaller and easier to print. And while it did complete successfully and looked okay from the top, the underside still showed some warping. Again, I tried changing the screws as the first layer went down and it seemed to be off to a good start but the reprint still suffered from the same issue. You notice this one is two color. I took the chance to test out the filament runout detection. The printer beeped, the touchscreen gave me logical instructions and it seemed to resume from the exact point. I really can't fault the way this part of the printer operates. I was still trying to give this a really good chance. So I opened up a new bag of ABS filament from X3D. I repeated the same print again and it went a lot better. While it was printing, I took the chance to test out a new toy a thermal camera and found that the bed was only hitting low 90 degrees Celsius. I also used a thermocouple probe to find that the internal chamber temperature just about hits 50 degrees Celsius during printing. Hoping that high quality filament might have finally cracked it, I opened up what I hoped would be a really useful print. This PCV vise would be perfect in ABS because it would be less prone to softening when the temperature of a soldering iron was nearby. All of the parts were loaded up in a full plate but I arrived the next morning to find this. Even with the new and better filament, some of the parts had completely peeled off and left spaghetti everywhere and other ones were well on their way to doing the same. 
So that was the extent of my test printing, and I'd like to start my summary by pointing out the things that this printer does quite well. It was very easy to get going, with great packaging, a really nice manual and intro video, and in terms of that, it would be easy to start out for a beginner. For a lot of these prints, it also has quite reasonable print quality. Certainly not the best that I've tested on a review machine, but enough to at least score a pass. However, many elements of this printer feel underdeveloped. Let's start with the slicer. The version of Cura that comes with this is quite old. And yes, there are settings for this particular printer, but there's no way to save any presets. So as you change temperature and other settings to switch between filaments, you'll need to write down or memorize your old settings so you can revert back to them. Now you might've noticed I was using Simplify 3D. I set up a new profile and copied over all of the start and NG code, as well as all of the other settings. I was told this printer would be compatible with S3D, but MakerPie were unable to provide me with a profile that I could import with everything set up. The touchscreen interface and the UI in general is very limited. The functionality is quite basic compared to what's offered on a lot of stock printers as well as aftermarket touchscreens. The way it operates the printer is a little bit clunky too. It's extremely slow to load and unload filament. It's also extremely slow when it homes, and considering it homes at the bottom of the machine and then has to return to the top before printing, that can really add up. Now it's advertised as having Wi-Fi and a camera, but honestly, that's a complete waste of time. You can connect to it directly from your phone and enter the website address, and you will see a live camera feed, but there's no way to connect the printer to your local network like you would with Octoprint, and that limits the physical distance you can be from the printer, so you might as well just walk over and have a look in the top. One of the changes since Angus's review is the introduction of these lid clips to hold it in place. It came with only two, and I was given the STL to print two more, but this is a clunky solution. They constantly fall off and inside the machine, sometimes on top of the print. The reason this is worse is that the reverse Bowden tube is too short, so when the print head moves to the front of the machine, it tugs on the plastic lid and dislodges it. My main qualm is with this leveling system. It takes quite a few minutes to fit this alternate head and then go through the procedure and then change it back to the other one. And on paper, it should have worked, but I still found it inconsistent. This would benefit greatly from having some sort of baby stepping built into the firmware and touchscreen so you could make fine adjustments instead of having to manually turn the leveling dial. I think part of the reason it's so inconsistent is that there's a fair bit of play and wobble in the Z-axis. I followed MakerPie's recommendations to tighten the bolts on the side but I was unable to get rid of this slop. Furthermore, the tolerances on the glass plate seem a little bit tight. I have trouble cleanly getting it in and out, so things probably jiggle around from that too. It's also worth noting that the ribbon cable is not properly secured, dangles down, and could potentially hit the top of the prints. Another thing worth mentioning is that the firmware is completely unknown. When I plug it into my PC via the USB cable, it doesn't come up as a COM port, instead coming up as a completely different device. I was unable to get it to connect with Pronterface or Octoprint, so that's something else to keep in mind. Revisiting Angus's review and the suggestions he made that I was told had been fixed up, in actual fact, I found that only two of them had been fixed. And for me, that sums up how I feel. If all of these things had been fixed, developed properly, and tested thoroughly, I feel this could be an excellent printer. But as it stands, it's a little bit half done, especially for the price. If you're printing only in PLA, you'll find a lot better quality for a lot cheaper printers. And if you're printing in ABS, the results I got on this weren't really any better than when I tested the pop-up enclosures on a standard open frame machine. Let's hope this time round, they actually take the feedback on board, develop the machine properly, and make it fulfill its potential. Have you got any thoughts on this particular machine? Please leave them down below in the comments. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe, and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.